Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship in this season of Pentecost. Welcome to all of you who are here. Welcome to all of you who are listening on the radio or watching on Facebook Live. We're just so glad to have you with us for this very special youth-led worship with our confirmation students, our seventh and eighth graders. We haven't done this in a while, so we're just so happy to have them here. Um, I want to thank Pastor Lane for taking the whole service last Sunday and also for filling in for one of our mentors who is on vacation and also all the work that he is doing for um, youth in general, release time and uh, Wednesday Bible School and so far he still has what hair he had left, right? Um, so that's great. And uh, Pastor Lane is having a meeting of anyone who, of parents and kids who are youth going to the, want to go to the um, ELCA Youth Convention next summer. So that's uh, 1045? Yep. 1045 here in the sanctuary. And that's today. Um, there's a lot of announcements in the bulletin. I'm not really going to call attention to any of them except things that are coming up. Um, things that are coming up are, I can't believe it, but Thanksgiving is a week from this coming Thursday. It's very early this year. That means you need to get your pie orders in early. Um, we haven't raised any of the pie prices. They're all the same 12 unless you want a pecan pie, in which case it is 16. So there's something in the bulletin and there's a, I think there's pie orders online as well. So those are due on the 19th, I believe. Let me just double check. Um, so um, that's something to note. Um, also, thankful gifts, the thankful gifts catalog will be uh, ready in a couple of weeks. Marlene is getting that ready. And this year we think that there's also going to be an opportunity to um, purchase thankful gifts online. So that'll be something new. Um, Advent is coming as well in a couple of weeks. And so we are getting ready, um, uh, as we always do in the next couple of weeks, with all the things we do here. It, it, on a beautiful day like this, it's hard to imagine. It's supposed to be 60 degrees on Wednesday. But yes, Advent is still going to come. So I, um, we're going to be looking for um, families or people, anyone who wants to read our Advent devotions during each of the four Sundays of Advent. Um, let's see. I think that's all. There's a lot, like I said, there's a lot of stuff in here, so please um, take a look through the bulletin. Take it home if you want. Put it up on your refrigerator. Um, but right, right now, I would like, if you are a veteran, if you would please stand. If you are the wife, husband, daughter, uh, aunt, whatever, if you are related to a veteran, please stand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And God bless you. And I think that is all of the announcements. So um, with that, let's all take a deep cleansing breath. Let's breathe in the Spirit of God. Let's breathe out all our cares and anxieties as we prepare to worship. God is with us. Please stand as you are able. Worship begins with confession and forgiveness found in your bulletin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the eternal voice from heaven, the anointed and beloved one, the spirit moving over the waters. Amen. As we approach the mystery of God, let us come in confession, trusting the love of Christ crucified and risen. God who searches us and knows us, you have shown us what is good, but we have looked to other lights to find our way. We have not been just in our dealings with others. We have chosen revenge over mercy. We have promoted ourselves instead of walking humbly with you. With what shall we come before you? Forgive us our sin and show us your salvation in the face of Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. 
Beloved of God, you have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, poured out for you in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Receive the promise of baptism. You are God's child. Your sins are forgiven. Rejoice and be glad, for yours is the reign of heaven. Amen. Our first hymn is number 438, My Lord, What a Morning.
first reading for today is from the book of Amos, chapter 5, verses 18 through 24. In the days of Amos, people thought the day of the Lord would be a time of great victory, but Amos announced it would be a day of darkness, not light. He said, liturgy is no substitute for disobedience. The Lord demands justice and righteousness in the community. Listen now to what the Spirit is saying to the church. Woe to all of you who want God's judgment day. Why would you want to see God, want him to come? When God comes, it will be bad news before it's good news. The worst of times, not the best of times. Here's what it's like. A man runs from a lion right into the jaws of a bear. A woman goes home after a hard day's work and is raped by a neighbor. At God's coming, we face hard reality, not fantasy, a black cloud with no silver lining. I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. This is God's word. We give thanks for your word. Today's psalm is Psalm 70. We will read responsibly as printed in your bulletin. God, please hurry to my rescue. God, come quickly to my side. Those who are on to me, let them fall over themselves. Those who relish my downfall, send them down a blind alley. Give them a taste of their own medicine. Those gossips all flicking their tongues. Let those on the hunt for you sing and celebrate. Let all those who are saying right say over and over, God is mighty. But I've lost it. I'm wasted. God, quickly, quickly. Quickly, my side, quick to my rescue. God, don't lose a minute. Today's second reading comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Some of the Thessalonians are worried that dead Christians will be excluded from the resurrection to eternal life when Christ comes again. Paul reassures them with the word of hope that all Christians, living or dead, will be raised into everlasting life with Christ. Listen now to what the Spirit says to this church. And regarding the question, friends that have come up about what happened to those already dead and buried, we don't want you in the dark any longer. First off, you must not carry on over them like people who have nothing to look forward to, as if the grave were the last word. Since Jesus died and broke loose from the grave, God will most certainly bring back to life those who died in Jesus. And then this, we can tell you with complete confidence, we have the master's word on it, that when the master comes again to get us, those of us who are still alive will not get a jump on the dead and leave them behind. In actual fact, they'll be ahead of us. The master himself will give the command, Archangel Thunder, God's trumpet's blast. He'll come down from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise. They'll go first. Then the rest of us who are still alive at the time will be caught up with them into the clouds to meet the, clouds to meet the master. Oh, we'll be walking on air. And then there will be one huge family reunion with the master. So reassure one another with these words. This is God's word. We give thanks to your word.
The Holy Gospel for this, the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, comes from Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus tells a parable about his own second coming, emphasizing the need for readiness at all times. Listen now to the good news the Spirit is bringing to the church. Jesus said, God's kingdom is like ten young bridesmaids who took oil lamps and went out to greet the bridegroom. Five were silly and five were smart. The silly bridesmaids took lamps, but no extra oil. The smart bridesmaids took jars of oil to feed their lamps. The bridegroom didn't show up when they expected him, and they all fell asleep. In the middle of the night, someone yelled out, he's here, the bridegroom's here, go out and greet him. The 10 bridesmaids got up and got their lamps ready. The silly bridesmaids said to the smart ones, our lamps are going out, lend us some of your oil. They answered, there might not be enough to go around, go buy your own. They did, but while they were out buying oil, the bridegroom arrived. When everyone was there to greet him, had gone into the wedding feast, the door was locked. Much later, the other bridesmaids, the silly ones, showed up and knocked on the door, saying, Master, we're here, let us in. He answered, Do I know you? I don't think I know you. So stay alert. You have no idea when he might arrive. This is the good news of Jesus. Praise to you, Christ. And you may be seated. And if there are any children here, any younger children, if you would like to come up, I have just a little um, something I'd like to
and grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, give us oil in our lamps that we might burn with love for you and love for our neighbor. In your name we pray, amen. So here's something you may not know about me. I have been in a lot of weddings, a lot of weddings. You cannot count them on two hands. I have been a bridesmaid so many times that in my first apartment, I had a closet just for bridesmaids' dresses. It is true. I won't tell you what happened to, uh, to all those bridesmaids' dresses, that's for another story, but there were poofy ones and sleek ones and red ones and purple ones and a really cool black and white one. But I know a lot about being a bridesmaid. And so I think that makes me really uniquely qualified to preach on this particular parable of Jesus, bridesmaids. But let's talk about this context, because when we read this and we hear this story about, you know, the 10 bridesmaids and the oil lamps and the bridegroom and like, where the heck is the bride? We might need a little bit of context. And so we don't know a lot about how weddings were done back in Jesus' time, but one of the things that, you know, is, is somewhat surmised is that the bridesmaids did carry lamps to um, sort of light the way for the bridegroom to come into wherever it was the wedding was going. So that's the part of this story that may have some historical resonance, that there were bridesmaids and lamps and a bridegroom. So we also have to know about the context in which this parable is told. As I have mentioned a couple of times, uh, Jesus told 33 parables during his ministry and 19 of them appear in Matthew's Gospel. And we are now to the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel of the 28 chapters there are. So we are getting close to the end. And in fact, this is the last parable that Jesus tells before he is taken away and tortured and crucified and he dies. This is the last parable that he tells. So things are very, very serious. This is the end of his mess, uh, ministry. Now, all of the parables are lessons about surprises, but this one seems especially challenging to me um, on many, many levels. So first of all, I have a problem with the fact that those five supposedly smart bridesmaids don't share with the silly bridesmaids. I mean, don't you feel like that's what you would have done? So that's the first thing I have a, a problem. And the other thing is, like, why did those silly bridesmaids listen to those snarky, smart bridesmaids? I mean, the, light, the lamps were not out yet. They were going maybe to come out, but why did they run off so soon? Shouldn't they have just maybe stayed there? And the third thing, and this is probably the hardest part, is the end of this parable, knocking. And the door is locked, and the master says, I don't know you. I mean, that is not the Jesus I know if we want to have Jesus be the bridegroom in this particular parable. So what is this parable about then if, if all of these kind of things that we don't like about it are happening? Keeping in mind that it is Jesus' last parable before he's taken away. So the first thing is that this parable is about a matter of faith and God's promise. And where does that come in? Well, if we look back at the text from Amos, we find out that Judgment Day may be coming, but Jesus is also very concerned with justice now. And in Thessalonians, in the text that was just read a little while ago, people were worried because in the time of the Thessalonians, it had been a while since Jesus left and he still hadn't come back. And so they were promised that Everybody would someday go off with Jesus, but now some people have started dying before he comes back. And so they're worried, what's going what's gonna to happen to those people? And then we get to Matthew's gospel, and throughout this, it's been kind of building in these last uh, parables and these last times that Jesus has been with his disciples. And so it's kind of a matter of urgency. But then we're also told that we have to be patient and wait and how can you be patient and have a sense of urgency at the same time? And then for us, 2,000 years later, what does it mean to be ready? What does it mean to be ready for Jesus to come back? 
How do we live faithfully in the meantime? Um, some of the things that I was reading this week um, about readiness and, and so on, it, it kind of talks about two different kinds of readiness. When we are healthy and well and things are going well in our lives, you know, you don't really think about being ready all that much. I remember back to, you know, 23 years ago during, remember the Y2K? Um, we were all worried about the, the you know, the, the computers were all going to stop and who knows what was going to happen and people stocked up on water and who knows what else, built bunkers under their houses and, you know, it was kind of a, a much ado about nothing. But sometimes we knew, we do need to be um, ready about things and readiness means something different. If someone you know is going through a hard time, if you yourself are going through a hard time, if you've gotten a tough diagnosis, if you are in hospice and towards the end of your life, readiness means something completely different. Why is the bridegroom so late? We've been waiting a long, long time for Jesus to come back. Why did the bridegroom not come till midnight? And when are we ready for the bridegroom to come? If those doors open up and Jesus comes in, we're in pretty good shape, right? We're all in church. We're going to be fine. But we're not like that every day. So what does it mean to be ready, kind of on a regular basis? What is this parable meant to do? Is it meant to warn us about being ready? Be prepared or else? Because that's what it kind of feels like when that door slams. But... Then we look at all those other messages from Jesus, all those other parables. The prodigal son, the father comes to, read, uh, to meet him even after he's been away for so long. The lost sheep and the lost coin. Jesus will do anything to get that last sheep and that last coin. We know in the book of Revelation that those 12 gates in, in uh, chapter 20 are always open. Whether it's day or night, the door is always open. And what about this running out of oil thing? I mean, we know from Jesus' other parables, the loaves and the fishes, that the bread and the, uh, the fish never run out. And we can go back to a whole different wedding. Jesus' first miracle, the wedding at Cana. And he made sure there was wine. He changed the water into wine so that there would be enough for all. So yes, this parable can be really cha challenging, and it can be really challenging for us personally because sometimes we feel like our own oil has run out and we don't really have anything to give anymore. But here's some more good news. Five lamps is enough. If you stand every other person and one has a lamp and the next one doesn't, there's going to be plenty of light. And in fact, if just one person is holding a candle, you can see that flame from a mile away, even in the dark. It doesn't take much light. So yes, we are supposed to be ready. Advent is coming, and we are preparing for Jesus to come again this year. But in the meantime, what are we going to do? One of the things that um, maybe some of you read as well is uh, called God Pause. Um, comes from Luther Seminary, and I thought there was a really good one on, I don't remember what day it was this week, but I um, cut it out. It says, according to the parable, the timing of the arrival of the bridegroom slash Jesus is uncertain, so the word is to be prepared. In the first generations of the church, Jesus' second coming was thought to be Im imminent, and this expectation drove much of early Christian understanding of the gospel. But later, when Jesus had not yet returned, questions began to emerge as to what, they were the, what were they to do now. Perhaps the answer is to focus more on Jesus' promise of his presence already now. It's to do the work of preparing the way, sowing the seeds, feeding the hungry, healing the sick, visiting those in prison. Perhaps the return of Christ is not regularly a part of our consciousness these days, but we can still be vigilant and prepared for the breaking in of God's rule in the world. Matthew's gospel is full of these wonderful parab parables, and most of them are hopeful and promising. And this one also sits with all of those others and reminds us that Jesus always opens the door and Jesus always provides more. And that when we ourselves are running out, 
we can look to those around us to give us a little light and a little oil. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, keep us on our toes, waiting and watching for your presence among us. In your name we pray, amen. Our next hymn is number 244, Rejoice, Rejoice, Believers. Please join us in silence as we re read our Confirmation Creed. I believe in God the Father who proceeds from for our, our God has answered our deepest questions and a purpose for our lives. I believe in Jesus Christ, a gift of God's grace. Jesus stands by our side. He suffers our pain and turns it into a blessing. I believe in the Holy Spirit, a divine presence in our life. The Spirit helps us find strength and help in time of need and creates in us a spirit of hope and renewal. I believe that our faith guides us. I know what grace is because God will never leave us, even when we mess up. I know the unconditional love of the Father that calls us to love and care for others. I know there is absolutely nothing that we can do that Jesus' blood hasn't already covered. I know the solid rock on which we stand. In the name of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Please stand as you are able for the prayers. Let us turn our hearts to God, our breath and life, as we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. 
Lord, we are grateful to be gathered here today. Thank you for bringing us together to worship as we enter the sport, sports playoff season and the holiday season. We pray for safe travels for everyone. Lord, please be with those who are living in places of unrest, particu particularly those who live in Israel and Gaza. Please protect the innocent and bring, them, bring peace to them. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for those who are battling cancer and other illnesses. We pray for those who are injured. We pray for healing and peace for those who suffer and for their families. Please be with Owen Hankin and Dave Olson as they are no longer with us, but still here in our hearts and thoughts every day. Hear us, O God. Um, yeah, we're supposed to say your mercy is great, I think, in that. So, uh, we offer spoken prayers for those held in our hearts and trusting in your mercy through our Lord Jesus Christ. Especially we pray for Linda Pierce, Marilyn Silling, Judy Tollisrud, Charlie Silling, Megan Miller, Carson Betcher, Helen Hermeyer, Lori Vestersey, Terry Rudy Simon, Gloria Robley, I own Selness, Nadia Wold, Lois Steele, Lisa Oldtwart, Linda Tollefsrud, Janet Fossum, Linda Newgard, Pastor Bob Stuskoff, Sharon Hansen, Paul Morgan, Don Stone, Lori Hagen Jensen, Lucas A.J. Wistie, Mary Amundsen, Anna Bingham Uris, Rachel Krensky, Sharon Onsted Johnson, Mavis Johnsrud and Jennifer Wedman. We also hold in our prayers our congregations in Southeast Minnesota Synod and our global Lutheran partners in Colombia, Tanzania, and South Sudan, especially for Christ Lutheran of Byron, Grace Lutheran of Wasika, Cannon River Lutheran Welch, St. Luke's Lutheran in Goodhue, St. Paul Lutheran Conger, Manga Lutheran in Tanzania, and Polgardi Lutheran Parish in South Sudan. All this we pray through our Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now the peace of Christ be with you always. Also with you. you may share that peace with one another. have the offering and I'm going to need some kids because it's a noisy offering so I hope everybody remembered to bring coins but if you didn't you're always welcome to throw in dollars or you know whatever you have gold bullion help with the noisy offering?
please stand as you are able. Let us pray. Gracious God, you break the bonds of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Receive these offerings in thanksgiving for all your works of merciful power and shape us as people of your justice and freedom. You we magnify and adore through Jesus our Savior. Amen. And now, gathered into, Holy, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, wherever we are, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May God shine a light on you. May God's blessings go with you and give you peace. Our final hymn is number 439, Soon and Very Soon. Beloved of God, go in peace and serve the Lord.